Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, second official day of LinuxConf uh, AU 2007 in Hobart. Uh, can I just mention, it's quite a large room, so when we get to question time, if when you've asked, sorry, when you've heard someone else ask their question, if you've got a question, if you could put your hand up so I can get the mic to you quickly so we make best use of our time. Uh, this morning's uh, first session is Lobbing Cats into the Wall Garden, a beginner's guide to reverse engineering internet message protocols. Uh, it's brought to you by Ian Robb, and I'll get out of your way. If you could introduce Ian, please. Hi, how's it going, everyone? You can hear me all right down the back there? Cool. Hi. Uh, yeah, so, hi. Uh, I'm Ian. Uh, I'm 21 in base 16. Um, and I had a really cool joke about uh, that I wasn't going to be lobbing any cats today, uh, but that instead I was going to lob some kit cats. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, but we're not supposed to throw food at the animals. So uh, if you have a good question uh, or you just like kit cats, uh, come up and see me afterwards. I've got a big bag of them down here. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, for the last 10 plus way too many years, uh, I've been working on reverse engineering protocols for the instant messenger known as Pigeon. Um, and if your reaction to that word is, oh, that's my IRC client, uh, that's probably not the most common reaction, uh, but I have heard that before. Um, but if your reaction is, do people still use Pigeon? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main <laughs> reaction I hear these days. And in fact, this slide, next slide, is for you guys. Do people still use Pigeon, IRC, uh, AOL Instant Messenger, or Yahoo, or any of the other protocols that I'm going to talk about during my talk? The answer is yes. And probably more people than you'd possibly imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like I say, um, I work with Pigeon. Uh, Pigeon ships with a few different protocols by default. Uh, and over the years, I've added one or two more. Uh, yeah, one or two. <laughs> so there's some big ones in there uh, you might notice is Skype, uh, Hangouts, Facebook, Yahoo. Uh, there's a couple of gaming networks in there. There's Steam and Battle.net, some SMS-based ones, which is Mighty Text, uh, Pushbullet, and Gamu for dumb phones. Um, and there's a few other ones which you might not be familiar with, which is uh, Rocket Chat, which is like a really good one uh, if you're wanting to replace Slack. Um, there's Omegle, which kind of started off the whole online uh, and some messaging on websites kind of thing. Um, and then there was OkCupid, which is a dating site, which was a bit awkward to uh, run past my wife, but she was all good with it in the end. Um, and then there's Ning, which is a, a social network for making other social networks. There's been a few others over the years, and I've helped out with other projects, but uh, these are the ones I could be bothered putting onto a slide. Um, so I started here in 2006. Uh, okay, so you can't really see it very well. This is a list of every single service uh, that uh, has an instant messaging protocol from about 1970 until about mid-2016 at the bottom there. Uh, so it's compiled by uh, sameroom.io, they, they made this list. Uh, sameroom.io bridges group chats between different services. Um, and because it's really hard to see, I've got a, a link at the, over there for um, downloading the PDF. That's uh, e.nz, the e's got a macron on it, which is really easy to type, uh, of course. Uh, but it's a nice short URL. Anyway, uh, so I started where the arrow's pointing, it's about 2006, and I started by typing uh, into Google a lot, Pigeon Skype plugin and hitting refresh, which of course is how open source software just gets created magically. Uh, so yeah, uh, funnily enough, there wasn't anything, so I, I had to go at making it myself um, and learned quickly about GPL violations, and that's probably a completely different talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the interesting part that I missed out on was probably about here uh, in 1999, um, and it was an interesting kind of uh, mouse and cat kind of game going on between uh, AOL Instant Messenger and MSN. Uh, so, at the time, uh, AIM, AOL Instant Messenger, was like the biggest uh, instant messenger provider in the States. Uh, they had most of the market share, and for some reason, their competitors wanted in on that action. Um, and so, Microsoft in particular uh, wanted in, and they did that by adding support for people to be able to use their AIM logins to log in uh, through the MSN Messenger. Uh, funnily enough, AIM AOL did not like that. 
Uh, and so they would start uh, blocking uh, EMC and from adding AOL support. Uh, and they did this in a few different ways. Uh, there's a link at the bottom there, a fascinating read about, about this going on from uh, one of the developers' perspectives at MSN. Uh, so AIM did it in a few different ways. They started by making daily changes to the authentication mechanisms. Um, they, they required you to download the ads to say that you were the actual AIM client, and if so if you weren't downloading the ads, you clearly weren't using AIM, so uh, that kicked you off. Uh, MSN got around that by downloading the, their ads, chucking them away, and displaying their own ads. Um, and then probably the most interesting one, buffer overflow code injection. <laughs> <laughs> the AIM developers found that uh, they could remotely execute code in the AIM client. <laughs> so they were sending down uh, assembly instructions, uh, and yeah, <laughs> crazy. Uh, so trying to cope with that uh, from a, a reverse engineering point of view and trying to uh, execute that code remotely, yeah, that wasn't cool. Um, so MSN, uh, they also didn't want people logging into their service. Um, so third-party clients like Pigeon, for example, um, we had to come up with a way to, uh, to authenticate with them. Uh, and that required a magic kind of function uh, that MSN came up with, with the idea that they would embed that into the, the client and that you'd need to re effectively reverse engineer the, um, the, the MSN client itself to be able to work out how that function worked. Uh, a bunch of people worked around that. Um, yeah. So I missed out on all that, which is great. Pretty happy about that, because that, that sounded hard. <laughs> Um, yeah, so AIM and MSN, they weren't very happy with each other. Um, but then by sort of 2005, 2006, everyone's all friends again. Um, so we had MSN, AIM, and Yahoo. They could talk with Reuters Messenger. Uh, MSN and Yahoo, they had an interop. You could talk to friends on each other's networks. Uh, AIM, you could talk to GTalk friends and stuff like that. Um, and clearly missing is MSN with AIM interop for some reason. Um, after that point, we kind of had a golden era of XMPP. And this was great. This meant that people like me uh, could put our feet up. We didn't have to do anything because it looked like everybody uh, was going to be moving to XMPP. Uh, it started off with uh, GTalk and later AIM having an XMPP service. Um, and probably more famous for non-developers was uh, Facebook added support for XMPP. Before that, it was only through web protocols that you could you could talk to Facebook. Um, and then even MSN had their own XMPP gateway, uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, the reason this came about was, um, so MSN had just bought Skype, um, and they wanted to, I mean, we know now that they've, they've transitioned everybody who was using MSN to, to use Skype, um, and part of that transition is that they wanted people who were using Skype to be able to talk to their MSN buddies. Uh, but the Skype client's a bit of a, pig, and uh, it was easier to make an XMPP gateway for MSN than it was to rewrite the MSN protocol and put it into the Skype client. Uh, the Skype client at that stage already had a Facebook integration through XMPP, um, so it was just easier doing it that way. Um, so there were a few other services at that time that were using XMPP. We had uh, WhatsApp, it was Kick Messenger, uh, League of Legends these days use it still, and LiveJournal. Um, Lots of people still use XMPP, um, but what we found was that there started to be a bit of a decline. Maybe death is a bit of a, a strong word. I mean, there's still definitely XMPP services around. Um, and I don't know, why did this happen? Uh, I've got a couple of theories. Um, I don't think there's any kind of concrete reason why, um, but I think this is probably the big one, is that XMPP, well, it's just not cool anymore. Everyone's moved away from it, uh, so it's fair enough. And the other one is it's not really great for mobile devices. I mean, at that stage, uh, there was quite a lot of overhead with the mobile device, which was constantly losing network connection as you transition you know, 2G, 3G to Wi-Fi, that kind of thing, um, or just even just flaky mobile connections. Um, so these days, there's lots of improvements with that to be able to um, to be able to continue a session on XMPP, and there's not quite so much of that overhead. Uh, yeah, so there's better things going on these days, but 
at the time, I think this is probably why, why we lost out. Yeah, so the bad old days. So looking, what was that, sorry? Uh, sure, we'll do a question now if you want, yeah. So uh, someone told me that there were issues with spamming and that's why some people stopped doing the XMPP uh, gateways. Is that true in your opinion or not so much? I think there's always an argument for that. I mean, there's a lot of XMPP spam that goes on these days. Um, I think as soon as anyone builds a, a third party client, it's always going to get some kind of abuse as part of it. Uh, I mean, that's an, uh, an argument that all of the main providers say that they don't want third parties on the networks is because, oh, it's just going to introduce spam to our users. And I guess there's kind of an argument for that, but um, I don't think XMPP is specifically to blame. I think anyone's going to get that spam regardless of what, what service they're on. Um, yeah, so the bad old days. Uh, used to be really, really hard to do reverse engineering um, because, yeah, you had to try and cram a lot of uh, bits down a you know 144k dial-up modem or that, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of hacks and tricks to try and get as much out of a very very small pipe as possible. Uh, you know these days with mobile phones and and big fat internet pipes, we don't really care. We're just happy to to just throw data at it, which makes it really really easy for uh, reverse engineers like us. Um, but it's good to know what what we had to do, and there's kind of that still that stigma as well. Uh, I've had a few people ask me, uh, "What do you what do we still use Wireshark um, to to reverse engineer?" And we don't need to do that anymore, which is great because looking at bits and bytes is hard and boring. Uh, some people may, maybe you like that kind of thing, but not me. Um, there were a couple of other tools that we had. So for example, there was OSPY, uh, which was like a LD preload kind of thing for Windows where it would inject itself into the Windows security system uh, so you could see all of the unencrypted traffic uh, rather than having to try and work out the encrypted traffic and go from there. Um, and then, yeah, assembly debugging, so having to actually reverse the binary to see what was going on. Well, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and you'll be glad too by the end of this talk, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so if you guys had to develop a new protocol today, if your boss came to you and said, oh, you know, our product's great, but we need to add a messaging component, uh, and once you've set a lot of WTFs at him, uh, you know, what would you use today? You probably wouldn't come up with your own custom binary protocol unless you really, really want that job security. Um, you're probably just going to slap through a few different, different uh, libraries and you know, use something that's really known. Um, so this is for you guys. So these days, um, it's a lot easier for us. Um, most of the instant messaging protocols going around at the moment are pretty simple JSON over web. Uh, so that's whether that's over HTTP, HTTP2, or web sockets. Um, so for example, that's mostly... Uh, so, for example, Pushbullet, uh, which is that SMS one, they use WebSockets uh, just for listening for events, and then they've got a REST API for, for sending out things. Um, Steam and Hangouts, uh, they use uh, what's called long polling. So you can say, uh, so rather than having to poll for messages and going, is there any messages, is there any messages, is there any messages, you say, is there any messages? The server waits around for a few seconds, deciding if there's any messages or not, and it'll either time out and you reconnect and poll for any new messages, uh, or it will just instantly return and say, yep, there's a message, uh, and it kind of gives you that pseudo instant messaging uh, feel without having to you know, rewrite uh, libraries or your, your web engine to be able to cope with uh, instant responses or you know, lots of polling, that kind of thing. Um, the other option that people are using these days, which is slightly less common, uh, which is still okay for us reverse engineering types, uh, is off-the-shelf libraries. So Protobuf is quite uh, popular at the moment. Um, so the Steam native client uses Protobuf. Hangouts uses native client as well. Uh, so uses uh, Protobuf. Uh, it's used by Battle.net as well. Um, whoops. Yeah, so there's still custom binary nonsense out there. So which is like iMessage and, and WhatsApp, they do some crazy things. Uh, Thrift is up there, that's, that's similar to Protobuf and that's used by people like Line and Facebook Mobile. 
Uh, so you're probably wondering why I'm giving away all my top secrets and exciting things. Uh, well, probably not. This is open source conference, right? We're all sharing our knowledge. Um, is it because I want you to be able to do OTR messaging over the top of other protocols and, and be able to have secure com conferences? Nope. Uh, is it because I want you to be able to write uh, accessible clients for, for blind people, maybe, whose screen readers software won't work with their, um, within the, third party, uh, the, the first party client? Uh, nope. It's none of that. Uh, the reason I am sharing with you today is because Americans like to elect presidents. And you're probably wondering what the crap that means. Uh, so I have been elected, for some reason, the president of the IMF. Uh, so to the IMF to my wife, it meant the International Monetary Fund, uh, which I am not the president of. Uh, no, I'm the president of IamFreedom.org. Uh, and what we are about is we're an, uh, a not-for-profit in the States um, that's trying to promote freedom of instant messaging. Uh, and one of the things that we, we have is we have a wiki of all the protocols. Well, we're trying to get a wiki of the protocols and documenting how they all work so that third party people uh, can write their own clients. Um, so kind of as a, a clean room kind of thing, talk about that a bit more. Um, yes, yeah, so I Am Freedom, we started up uh, just uh, during the, the phase where Pigeon had to change its name from what it was previously. Uh, so that we have a lot of uh, legal contacts as well. So if you, you know, if you're getting into trouble with legal kind of side of things, uh, we can put you in, in touch with the right people there. Yeah. Um, so the wiki at the moment is uh, it's used quite a lot by uh, security researchers. Um, recently, there's been a few uh, write-ups about the iMessage protocol. Uh, we have some some docs on our wiki about that, uh, and so we've got some security researchers who uh, who use that information to. Um, work out whether or not Apple is spying on your messages and, and whether they can read what you're saying and that kind of thing uh, is quite interesting. But really, we're just here um, so that we can get you guys to help contribute to our wiki. Be great. Now, this is a picture of a cat's bum. You can tell it's a cat's bum. There's some back legs there, and we've got the, um, the, the swisher there. and. The reason I've got a picture of a cat's bum here is for a really, really juvenile joke. I am not a lawyer. So the, the loyal, lawyer kind of stuff is kind of a gray area when it comes to reverse engineering. Um, but it's really great to know what laws you're going to be breaking while you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, just for the next little part of this talk, just remember cat's bum, cat's bum, cat's bum. OK. So what country's laws do we have to care about? Well, you have to care about you know, the country that you, you're in. Uh, you also have to care about where your code is hosted. And you also have to care about the internet police. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start with the most important law, which is uh, my country's law. Um, we added a little section to it in 2008 uh, to our Copyright Act um, that specifically talks about reverse engineering, which is really nice because before there was nothing about it and we had no idea what we were doing, so we just kind of carried on blindly hoping that nothing bad would happen. Um, so the law says that we're allowed to reverse engineer stuff, which is really, really cool. Uh, the law also says you can't uh, accept an end user license agreement that says you can't reverse engineer stuff. Also cool. But, and this is the cat's bum, you can be sued under contract law. So by saying, yes, I accept these terms and conditions, and then you go and break them by reverse engineering their protocol, uh, yeah, you can still be sued. I haven't actually found any legal cases of this happening in New Zealand, so that's cool, I think. Uh, maybe we're just too small that no one cares about us. Uh, but maybe now that people have seen this slide, I might get a few letters in the mail. Oops. Um, then there's this country. I don't know if you guys know this one. Um, I was actually really shocked because um, I didn't know anything about Australian law before getting into this. Um, so I was really shocked that you, you had your Australian law, but you also had your American law that you had to follow from some free trade agreement thing going on. Whatever, what's up with that? Um, but I was also shocked that it was quite a spiritual kind of process. You've got this, this ideas versus expression thing going on. It's kind of spiritual and airy-fairy. Um, so you're allowed to copy an idea, but you're not allowed to copy an expression of that idea. 
Um, and you guys have got a lot of court cases about that, um, and I suggest you go read up about them because they are interesting. But because I'm not a lawyer, I can just say, I'm sure you'd be fine. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> hey, whatever. Um, but, but, but more seriously, uh, you probably want to do something like uh, clean rooming to protect yourself. So clean rooming is uh, you get one group of people to go and reverse the protocol, and they write down all their documentation and notes, they pass it to a completely separate team, um, and then you know, there's no kind of, there's no way that, that the second team could be, have been looking at the source code or the protocol to be able to um, endanger themselves in terms of legal stuff. Um, there's a nice little short link there with the E with the macron ag again on it. That's an I, not an L, uh, with a really interesting write-up from a real Australian lawyer uh, who gives a bit more talk about that. Um, but, cat's bum, can anyone tell me the difference between these two blocks of code? Can't read it. But that's okay, you don't need to read it, because I'll give you a hint, they're both exactly the same, except one of these is legal, and one of these is completely illegal. Um, yeah. So the one on the left was handwritten. Uh, so this is the uh, Hangouts protobuf. Um, the one on the left was written by looking at the protocol, uh, the Hangouts servers. You can say that you want your responses to be in either protobuf or you want them to be in JSON format or a combination of the two, which is really horrible to work with, called proto-json. Uh, yeah. Um, so you, that's how the, the one on the left was worked out. The one on the right was just completely stripped out of the, the binaries, out of Hangouts, um, and it's completely illegal. Don't do that. Um, but the only way you're going to really be able to protect yourself is if you have kind of that, that documentation either through the I Am Freedom Wiki uh, or through notes that you've taken yourself, basically a paper trail uh, to show that you haven't just stripped it out of their, out of their software and done the illegal thing. Uh, then, so we've got this guy here. Uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. <sighs> yeah, okay, so it says you're allowed to reverse engineer and circumvent protection for interoperability. That's really cool. Great. That's everything we want. Uh, except you can uh, EULA away your rights. So if, you, if the end user license agreement says you can't reverse engineer and circumvent protection, then you can't do it. Um, so that's not so great. And pretty much everyone these days has that clause in their end user license agreement. So if you can somehow install or sign up for these services without accepting the end user license agreement, that's great. Um, also don't sign an NDA or anything because that makes it kind of messy as well. Um, sometimes you can get away with it by modifying the, the form um, that you sign up with, like the Steam form, it uses a lot of client-side validation. So you can actually go and edit the, the form to not tick the yes, I agree, and then hit the submit button, and uh, it'll carry on and let you sign up for an account anyway. <laughs> so, hey, does that count? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Well, I don't know. <laughs> what? Um, but this is the problem, is that DMCA takedowns are real. Um, so, f most famously, we have problems with uh, WhatsApp and Line Messenger, L-I-N-E, uh, if you can't understand my accent, and there's a lot of um, examples of these on GitHub's uh, DMCA page, which is really, uh, it's quite sad. Uh, they've been going around since uh, 2014 was the first uh, takedown notice that I could find, um, and it still happens today. Um, they claim... I mean, they can just be quite loose with it and say that you're violating the copyright, uh, please take down the code, and GitHub doing their safe harbor thing will just take down the code. Um, the nice thing about GitHub putting it on GitHub is that you can see all the counter notices, uh, which you can copy and paste, so you can reply back to GitHub and say, oh, no, it doesn't infringe. Uh, the downside is, is that you have to say that you will appear in American court to testify um, that you didn't break their copyright. Um, so WhatsApp took this further. Oh, you've got a, a question, yeah? So what happens if you have uh, someone in a different country who just agrees to that, gets all the stuff you need, and then uploads it to you to your anonymous FTP site, and you may not even know who that is? Um, obviously, you didn't do anything wrong. You just got the data you needed from someone that you may not know. What happens then? Isn't that what people do in this case, like to, to make sure you're clean, someone else gets it, and yeah. then just give it to you? 
I mean, they're still copying, right? They're still. I mean, a clean room is probably the best way of, of getting around it. Um, right, but even for a clean room, you have to agree to the uh, agreement that says you're not going to do that. Yeah. So yeah. if someone else does it, writes the spec, yeah. they break the agreement, but you didn't, yeah, and they gave you the spec, yeah. then you're clean. The other person isn't, but who cares who that person was? Yeah, fair enough. Who cares about them? Okay. <laughs> sure. If you're willing to sacrifice yourself and accept a whole bunch of end user license agreements for us, great. I'm right. not going to complain. Um, but yeah, I don't want anyone to go and put themselves in, in legal hot water just because. But it could be in a country where those laws are not valid. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, ju just wondering yeah, right, if yeah. that works. Yeah, that might work. That okay, might work. I'm not a lawyer, so I'll say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so WhatsApp uh, and Lime to some extent have taken uh, DMCA takedowns a bit further. Um, so rather than just going after developers with DMCA takedowns, they've started going um, and targeting their users. Um, so if WhatsApp catch you using a third party client for whatever reason, uh, they will ban you from WhatsApp and they'll ban you permanently. Um, and what really sucks about that is that your phone number is tied to your WhatsApp account. That's, that's how you log in to WhatsApp. Um, and so for a lot of people in, in, in a lot of countries, they can't actually get a new phone number very easily, if at all. Um, and so a lot of these people have been you know, rejected from their social groups because they can't get on WhatsApp anymore. Um, and that's really, that's really stupid. I mean, especially if you've got a legitimate reason like uh, my screen reader can't work with WhatsApp or, or I don't have a phone, um, but I want to talk to my friends still. Uh, so that's really sad. Um, and then there's this, which I don't know. I mean, for you Australian guys, it's probably not going to be a big deal. For American guys, it's probably not a big deal either. Um, the law and the language in the TPPA seems to be pointing towards copying the DMCA. Uh, so for New Zealand, that's pretty scary because what we do is it doesn't really match up with the TPPA, uh, uh, with the DMCA, sorry. And um, so this is a quote from the New Zealand government basically saying, uh, we're going to have to do something about this, but we don't know what. Um, we'll just make something up. So uh, we'll see what happens. So now the meat in the sandwich. This is why you're all here. How do we go about doing reverse engineering? Oh dear, I've got the wrong slide next. That's all right, we'll just pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, so we're going to do the same process that we'd use for any other project, and we will uh, make a sacrifice to the internet gods um, and hope that we get a good, uh, good project out of it. Please ignore this next slide. We'll just look at the pretty dog instead. That's my mum's dog, Harry. So ignore that. <laughs> so this is the real, this is the real bit. This is the real bit. Um, so I recommend you try all of these tools up here. Uh, we've got MIT and Proxy, which is really, really cool. Does everything except it's got a, it's all command line based. And I'm not a fan of command line stuff. Maybe you guys are. I don't know. Um, Fiddler 2 is another really great uh, open source um, proxy server um, that we're gonna that we're gonna try. Um, my favorite is Charles Proxy. It's not free uh, software, uh, but it's made by a company in New Zealand and. It's got a nice GUI, which is cool. Um, and then if you don't want to use anything else, uh, you can just use your browser's web inspector, so that's F12 or Control-Shift-I, and just use the developer tools. Um, I, yeah, I recommend you try all of them and see what works for you, because what works for one person isn't going to work for another. Um, they're all slightly different, but they're all, they all kind of achieve the same goal of being able to see what traffic is going on. Um, yeah. So the next main part that we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking for patterns. Uh, we're going to be looking for basically a few different objects. We're going to be looking for a buddy. Um, so that mostly involves looking at their ID, whether that's a number or an email address or a, or a handle or something like that. Uh, there might be things around that like their icons, their aliases, their online offline status. You don't need to worry about that to begin with. Uh, we're just going to be looking for them. Um, the buddy list, so your, your list of friends, uh, how, how we, we update that, uh, how it's stored, a message, so that whether it's formatted or not, whether it's plain text, uh, how we're going to send and how we're going to receive them. A conversation, so a group of messages, for example, um, but that involves you know, what participants are in that, in that conversation, how do we invite someone into that, how do we leave that conversation, and then right at the right, very bottom, very, very bottom, leave it to last, is the login process and authentication. 
don't start with that. If you start with that, you're going to go crazy. Uh, most people don't want third parties logging into their system, so leave that to last. You can just copy cookies um, if you have to. Um, so then we've got, yeah, go with a clean room, uh, give yourself a paper trail. Uh, I use pen and paper, which is uh, apparently not normal, but I, I like pen and paper. Um, we're also going to want to uh, work out how we get the event stream, whether that's the, that long polling I was talking about or web sockets. We want to record uh, all the URLs that are involved. Um, so yeah, clearly we're going for the, um, the web kind of side of things. So we want to record whether it's a post, a get or put, um, and then the actual data that gets sent as well. Great. So this is the scary part of the talk. Uh, why did I agree to do a live demo? That's insane. Okay, so I'm going to do a live demo, and I've got here uh, Charles Proxy set up. Um, so the great part about Charles Proxy uh, is that it works really nicely with mobile clients, uh, with mobile phones, sorry, and it has this really helpful thing where you can go and set up a um, a root certificate on your mobile device. The cool part about that means that you can start listening to HTTPS traffic. Um, your phone basically trusts your computer uh, as being a, an SSL certificate provider, um, which allows you to, to sniff all the HTTPS traffic. Uh, and most protocols these days are over HTTPS, so that's very helpful. Uh, MITM proxy has a similar has a similar process. Um, and then this. The next scary part, I've got a picture of my phone. Uh, right, so just uh, getting a bit of information. Uh, hands up if you guys use Facebook Messenger. Okay, that's about 90% of you. Uh, how about if you use WhatsApp? It's about 50%. And Line Messenger? Two, three. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm not going to demo any of those. <laughs> well, I don't want to ruin the fun when you guys are going to go do it, right? Um, so instead, I'm, uh, I'm going to show Steam. Uh, so Steam is a really, really great one to get started with. And the reason for that is it's really, really simple. Uh, there's not much to it. It's, it only does instant messaging. Uh, it doesn't do like group chats, which can complicate things. Um, and it's a really, really great one to start out with. Um, the upside is that you have to spend five dollars uh, to get a Steam account that you can chat with, which means it gives you a great procrastination source if you get really <laughs> bored of doing all this. Um, so yeah, I've got my, my phone client there. I'm just going to go into the proxy server here and I'm going to start recording. Boop. Boop. All right, back into my phone. Um, so pretty simple, really. We just want to get some, some packet captures. So we're going to fire up the Steam client on my phone here. Whoop, I stick, skipped a step. Uh, I've got to show you how to set it up. So you want to set it up by going into your, your Wi-Fi settings, uh, editing or modifying your network config. And there's an advanced options here that you probably never, ever used before. Uh, and you want to set it up to point to your proxy server, uh, which is, uh, in this case, my child's proxy machine. Um, and all the network traffic now is going to start going through your um, proxy server, and hopefully nothing sh dodgy shows up. Um, after that, you're going to want to fire up your web browser and go to the uh, the login uh, the URL that will install the certificate, uh, which is chls.pro slash ssl in this case. MIT and proxy has a very similar thing. Ask if you want to download the um, certificate. We can say yes, and then it will try and install it on the system. I'm not going to do that because I've already done it before. Um, but yeah, now all of your traffic is unencrypted, and you can see exactly what's going on. So we're going to fire up Steam. Uh, I'm going to look for my particular friend in here, Cat Bum. There we go. Hi, Cat. How's it going? And hopefully Kat replies. Yay, hi Ian, your talk is going great. Excellent choice with a live demo. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> oh boy, no, no, no. Uh, right, so that's pretty much all we need to do in terms of packet capture. Really easy, right? Um, and that should have given us all we need to know. Uh, in this case, Steam has given us two, two URLs. We've got a secure one at the top here, and I'm going to have to poke my head around the corner. Um, no, I'm going to do my. Uh, so I, just in case everything went went wrong, uh, I pre-recorded uh, some packet captures. 
just because I'm not totally insane. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, this is what uh, Charles shows you as a, um, as a request going to the server. We can see it's got a bunch of security stuff in there, um, an ID of the person that we're sending it to. Uh, we've got the text of the message that we sent. Pretty easy. Uh, we've also got in there uh, information we can request uh, to try and get information about a user. So that's to get their, their name, their, their avatar, uh, what their ID is. Again, it's pretty easy. Um, excuse me. And there's a URL here that, that gets your buddy list. Really, really easy. So, um, yeah, most of the services you'll find have got really simple, um, straightforward APIs like this. Um, yeah, so it's not going to be too scary. Uh, hopefully, that's dispelled a lot of the, the, the kind of bad thoughts. Um, the other one that uh, so Steam has is, is the long polling, so where it keeps on requesting the same URL over and over again until it gets a response. Uh, nope, that is not that one. Apologies. Oh, live demos, aren't they great? Um, yeah, so we can just, so this is the, the stream, it's just asking over and over again, are there any messages? And no, it's just saying there's nothing until we get to uh, response from the server, and it finally just comes back and says, yes, this is the message. Um, it's got some plain text in there. So you can use whatever JSON library you want to use with what, whatever HTTP library you want to use. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the code side of things because uh, Pigeon and stuff is all written in C, and you probably don't want to see C code. So that's, yeah. So yeah, that's a beginner's guide uh, to reverse engineering and some messaging protocols. Thanks for everybody for listening. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ian. That was awesome. Do we have any questions? Hey there. Hmm. Uh, a lot of services these days are starting to use uh, certificate pinning. Uh, on Android, it's probably a lot easier to reverse engineer. Um, but how, have you had any experience or luck with uh, IOS apps and certificate pinning and bypassing that? Yeah, so certificate pinning, that's, um, that's a good uh, question. So uh, that's the, the case where you can't actually intercept the HTTPS traffic, even if you say you're a, you're a signing authority, uh, because the, the app is making sure that the certificate it's getting from the server is a specific certificate. Uh, the way around that is to use an older iOS device. I think certificate pinning wasn't until iOS 8, maybe. Uh, so use an iOS 7 device or switch to an Android device. Um, otherwise, if you can get away with it, try and use a web browser. So like Steam, for example, uh, lets you chat through your browser, um, which makes it a little bit easier as well. Yeah, so there's no, uh, no, there's no real way to get around certificate pinning other than try and avoid using it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just wondering if you or know of someone um, who's reverse engineered Signal or, or used their infrastructure and what happened? Uh, so Signal, Signal's an interesting one. Uh, so Signal and Telegram, like, like they're the big, you know, the other ones that are kind of going head to head at the moment. Uh, Telegram's a mess for technical reasons, uh, but Signal's a mess kind of for political reasons. Uh, so Signal doesn't actually want um, you using their servers which is uh, really annoying. Um, but I mean, that's, they just say don't use our servers. So um, I mean, all of the, the code for Signal and Telegram are both online. So you can go and um, use them if you want to. There's no really, really much of a need to reverse engineer those protocols. Um, there's lots and lots of libraries. Some of them are easy to use and some are not. Uh, the ones in C aren't. So uh, I haven't really gotten into the Signal side of things at the moment. So have you had any issues with companies just throwing lawyers at you even if they have no case just because they have money and they want to shut you down? Have I personally had Are you or anyone working on this project? Because I mean, you obviously have like 20 companies on the other side. It only takes about one of them to be pissed off. And even though what you're doing is lawful, hmm. they may still try to shut you down just because they have money and lawyers. Yeah, so um, that happened um, with the line 
uh, the purple line plugin for Pigeon uh, to be able to connect to the line protocol. Uh, their lawyers basically chased them around the world to every single hosting company that they hosted with. Um, they ended up hosting it themselves. I'm not sure where they're based out of now. Um, so yeah, that is a that is a real thing. Um, I don't really have a, a good solution to that other mm. than uh, either hosting a company uh, country where you know those those laws are a bit different. Um, yeah or respond to those DMCA counter notices, but I mean, that's, that's quite demoralizing, I reckon, um, having to reply to them and, you know, you're trying to do something good for, for their users yeah. and they're, they're coming after you um, because, oh, you're gonna send spam to our, to our users and stuff like that, so, yeah. And a totally different one, I noticed Google Talk from time to time will not let me log in unless I log in on the browser and it knows that my IP is not okay and then I can go back and pitch in and actually log in. Um, is that a common problem that affects protocols, or just Google, or? Yeah, no, that, that happens quite a lot, actually. Um, so I have the same problem with um, Skype. Uh, every time I'm logging in at the conference, it's asking me to log in through the web browser before I can use it in Pigeon, um, which is kind of a pain. Uh, yeah, so it's not just limited to, okay. to Google. Um, I think, yeah, they're trying to do it as a protection mechanism, um, but that makes it really hard for, for projects like Bittleby, which is an IRC server um, that uses libpurple to connect to lots of different protocols. Um, so if they're running a public service on a server in Estonia, say, I don't know, um, and you're trying to connect from Australia, uh, the big providers are gonna say, hey, someone from another country is trying to hack into your account when it's legitimately you. Um, so using two-factor for the indication for that kind of thing uh, helps. Uh, most of the protocols I work with, they have that two-factor authentication in there, but they're really hard to work with in terms of reverse engineering. Uh, so like the Microsoft one with Skype, for example, it relies on you downloading a, a GIF image that has to be one by two pixels and the size of the GIF changes, it's, it's quite messy. Um, but yeah, so that, yeah, no, it's not just limited to Google. Uh, most of the big companies will do that uh, to try and protect their users from, from scammers and stuff like that. So it means that the support in the uh Pigeon is not as uh, doesn't have all the authentication that would be on on the web client. Yeah, uh, so Pigeon's kind of special because uh, we have a separation between our user interface and um, our backend. So all of the um, all the protocols and stuff don't actually uh, can't connect to the user interface to be able to do a lot of that stuff. So there is some functions for being able to do two factor authentication and and solving captures and stuff. I've got that I've got it into Steam uh, where. It, they'll send you a Steam mobile code and then you just type in that five letter code into Pigeon and it will, and it will authenticate. I haven't got that going yet with um, Skype or, or Hangouts. Um, yeah, so it's really, you, you can, once you get started in, in doing a protocol, you can, um, you can really get into it. There's a lot of little nitty gritty stuff if you, uh, if you really get into it. And for, if you're just writing uh, a project that just connects to one protocol, you're probably gonna have a lot of an easier time than trying to work with something like libpurple that tries to, to smooth over all those differences. Um, but yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, yeah. Uh, you said you've had some fun dealing with companies um, trying to stop you reverse engineering for what we're all familiar with. They don't get open source. What about companies that arguably have a business case for not wanting you to reverse engineer? like? Snapchat wanting to be able to guarantee privacy by having pictures disappear. Have you had any experience with that? <sighs> Guaranteeing privacy. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, everyone's going to try and tell you not to do it, but that's no fun. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, so for example, Yahoo, they said that no one, there was no third party client that you could connect to with Yahoo um, when they rewrote their protocol at the end of last year. And that was more of a challenge uh, to me rather than, hey, you can't actually do this kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, sure, there's always gonna be an argument of, you know, we wanna respect our users' privacy, we don't wanna get spam on our networks and stuff like that, but um, going back to the, the philanthropic side of things, you know, there's, the Snapchat client isn't great for people who have to use uh, screen readers. Um, it, you know, it's not gonna be great if you wanna write a command line uh, executable to be able to send pictures or whatever. You know, there's there's lots of reasons to be able to talk to a, uh, a third party service that I don't think those original people are gonna have thought up. Um, and I think you're gonna be contributing towards the network rather than taking away from it. I don't think it's, yeah. But they're gonna try and stop you regardless if they care.
I mean, that, that said, there's some, been some people who have contacted me because they're, they're happy for me to get in touch and to, to reverse their protocol and, and expand their user base and that kind of thing. Um, OK Cupid guys, once they saw what I was doing, they, they sent me docs, which was really cool. Um, oh, and that, my phone decided OK Cupid was OK Google. Uh, <laughs> no? Uh, what? <laughs> I'm glad that wasn't on the screen. Um, yeah, so it's not always doom and gloom. There are there are companies out there who are really nice, and they will get in touch, and they will say, hi, thank you for, for using our protocol. How can we make it better for you? Um, I've had a couple of emails from people uh, in the past who say, uh, is it all right if you take your code down because we don't really want you know, our authentication process being public? And, well, if I'm not going to do it, then probably someone else is. So mm, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, any more questions? If that's the case, and I'd ask you to thank Ian for an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you.